Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we continue with part three of our Atari Tempest hacking session. Today, the fun stuff begins where we can inspect what the original programmer was doing and even add and modify things in the game and test them out live in MAME, complete with a debug monitor. That's only possible because of the work we did in the previous episodes to create a buildable assembly listing for Tempest that we can look at, scroll through, and even build into a real ROM set whenever we want. We'll start our code tour at the beginning, at the top of the listing. So let me zoom this in a little bit, if I can do just the editor font. There we go. So let me give you a little tour of the comments and the file here itself. So my first trick was to find an assembler that could take the IDA Pro output and actually generate programs from the output that is generated by the IDA Pro disassembler. You'd think that would be simple. I would assume that IDA generates a standard 6502 format, but I was having trouble finding anything that would actually process it properly. What I did find was a assembler called the HXA assembler by a guy, here's his name. I'm not gonna try and pronounce that baby. Anton Truenfels, hard to guess. Sorry, sir, if that is your assembler and not your name. Oh, what else is interesting here? It's a 6502A processor, and why is that important? Because it actually runs at 1.5 megahertz. Be nice if you could just magically order up a CPU that was 50% faster than the baseline, but that's a luxury that you could only afford at one megahertz, not at five gigahertz, apparently. So MAME itself had switched ROM formats a couple of times, which has meant that I've had to pop my ROMs back out, reread them if I want a copy of my original ROMs, which is what we've done here in this project today. But we pulled them out 2K at a time because there are 10 2K ROM files. So they are mapped in at 9,000, A thousand, B thousand, C thousand, and D thousand. No, I don't really say B thousand. A zero zero zero, B zero zero, C zero zero, D zero zero, and again at F zero zero zero. And I think we talked about this already. I mentioned how because of the reset vectors, this last chip is actually or the last 4K. Apparently, the last two chips look like they are remapped up at the top of memory. So they appear at D0 and E0, and then they're repeated at E0 and F0. So it's loaded at D000 and repeated up at F000. As mentioned earlier, there's a vector ROM lives at 3000. Actually, there are two ROMs, a vector and a color ROM, I believe. They live down at like 3000 and 2000. Is that actually a RAM? No, it's two 2K ROMs again. So at 3000 in the memory map, we have 4K of ROM again, but that is the vector and color ROM. We have a number of hardware devices that are mapped into memory here, like the right coin counter and the vector generator launch go signal. Watchdog clear. And watchdog is a circuit that you have to tell it every so often. I don't know what it is on Tempest. Let's say every 60th of a second. You've got to say, I'm cool. It's good. I did all my calculations and I came back. You keep whacking the watchdog, it's called. And if you don't do that, it'll reboot you. So if you get hung up in some loop, if you get stuck processing an interrupt, if you get hit by a cosmic ray or static charge or something goes wrong, that you don't get back in time within a 60th of a second to tell the processor that I'm cool and the code is still running, it will reboot you because that's probably a better option in almost every case than hanging. EA ROM is electronically alterable read-only memory. It is where the high scores are kept. It's kind of slow to erase and alter. I don't know if you can erase it as a batch. I haven't actually looked at the code that reads and writes this EA ROM yet. I just kind of know that that's where the high scores are stored. I have not looked at the hardware part of it. Up at 6060, 70, and 80, we have the math box functions, which looks like there is a buffer and a way to tell the math box to start. So that's uh, about the extent of my knowledge of the math box too, is that you can give it equations, probably 3D rotations or who knows what it's doing. Probably division and multiplication or something weird. Um, that's, that's probably a good topic for another video. The Atari math box. What on earth did they do? It's all custom, but it's uh, built with like TTL logic chips. So it's like a math coprocessor built with raw chips. It's cool in that sense, but how it works, I don't know. The audio chips in these machines are called pokies. We have two pokies, pokey one and pokey two. So I believe we can do two waveforms. A couple of bits here at 60E0. One is the state of the one player LED, the two player LED, and then the flip, which is whether or not the video signal is inverted. And that is used for the sit down machine where the picture flips every alternate uh, player cycle so that the guy sitting on the other side gets his picture right side up. So the option switches are at D00 and E00. What's stored in the option switches? Well, the game options. How many lives per game? When the bonuses kick in? what language is being run, various billing options in terms of how many credits, game difficulty, where the player can start. 
there's really not a lot of difference in Tempest. By the time you get to higher levels, the difficulty is largely the same, except for the number of shots on the screen at a time, I believe. You will get pulsars shooting at you and think tankers breaking in diffuse balls perhaps earlier. It's been a long time since I've watched the yellow levels, but it changes some of the time scale with which things come into the game, but if you get to a high enough level, it's all the same almost. I believe you can have one more enemy on the screen and one more shot on the screen in hard. Here are the billing options, bonus coins, how many coins per credit, and so on. And finally, we actually get into some 6502. <clears throat> These are just assembly directives to say that we're going to generate an object file, a listing file. Here are my build customizations. These are changes that I've already made. So once I got Tempest to the point that I could build the original ROM image from my own sources, I then started to make customizations. But I always did them in ifdefs so that you could at any time go back and pound define them. Or it's not pound define, it's dot define. So that at any time you can go back, define them as zero, and it will generate the original ROM image again. So that was the way, and I would always make sure that every time I made a change, I would build it both ways and then make sure that, yes, if I build it this way, I get the original ROM image. If I build it that way, I get my modified code. So here's an example, the Dave PL message. It's set to zero. If I set it to one, There's my build. There, just built Tempest. Takes about four seconds. And that's under emulation on a Mac Pro. Running a 6502 cross assembler made for Windows under Parallels emulation. And it's still darn quick. It's dutifully notifying us here that the file does not match the original ROM. That's in my batch file, the build file, to let me know. And then it splits. You'll see too many files here uh, because it actually does both main ROM formats, old format and new format, because to burn them, I find it much easier the old format, the 2K per file bit. I also have a small utility called split ROM that takes the 20K binary file and spits out the 2K chunks and the 4K chunks. I could show you that, but you can imagine it spits out 2K chunks and 4K chunks. If you need the code, let me know. I'll post a link to it, but I'm not going to go through it in this video, but I'm happy to share. Now this is gonna look weird again because we just built it on the Windows side, but now I'm gonna run it on the Mac side because I'm actually running MAME on the Mac side with the ROMs built on the Windows side. It's actually very simple, but it just sounds really complicated, trust me. Let's see if we get anything. Yep, we're getting a message that the ROMs don't match. That makes sense. The game may not run correctly. And it's, that's true because it's got my modifications. Here's our summary again. Two pokies, 16502. Now you'll notice it says game over, Dave PL. Game over, Dave PL. Game over, Dave PL. Dave PL message. Let's go look at the code for Dave PL message. So if you define it as one, which we just did, and we ran it that way, the only difference is instead of saying insert coin, it now says, or free play, I guess in this case I've actually changed. Which one have I changed? Oh, insert coins. So I changed the words insert coins to be just Dave PL. At first I was just gonna pre-populate the score table with my high scores and my name because I, why not, it's my machine. But then I realized it's the guys who actually worked on the game, designed and wrote the game that have their names and initials in the high score table now. And I'm certainly not gonna replace that. So I just put it over top of insert coins and I lose that message, but I get the customization of Dave PL. And that way I know it's my ROM set. And what would happen if you deployed this to the field? Well, if you did this just as it was, then Tempest would self-destruct. And we'll find out more about the copy protection when we start to look at the bugs, because the copy protection actually has a bug in that it fires when it's not supposed to. The next build customization that I added is called Remove Self-Test. There were very few extra bytes left over. There were a few extra bytes, but I used those for my modified start table because I put many more entries in there than the factory code does. So that was kind of already a wash. So if you want to add any extra code, you need to make room for it. And the easiest way to do that was first to remove the self-test code because I don't necessarily need it. And if you want to run self-test, just run the original ROM image and then test the hardware that way. And because I actually run this with a switch ROM that I just switch back and forth, which one boots, that's actually pretty simple to do. So I don't need the self-test code in there. Similarly, I don't need the three or so other languages that are built in because I only speak English and the game's not going anywhere. So. You could change that. If you wanted to get rid of English, you could do the same thing. But then I couldn't play it. I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know how to press start. Remove self-test. Let's see what this does. Ah, so if you get here and there still is self-test code, 
then it jumps to it. If the self-test code has been removed and you get to this code that would normally go to the self-test code, it just jumps to reset. Wasn't quite sure what else to do. That seemed like a reasonable thing. The second case here, it looks for the self-test switch, which I believe is the switch inside the door of the coin door. And if that switch is on, and here's the actual self-test code, so that if it is not defined, the code is still there. If you do define it, all this code goes away. And it is a fair bit of code all the way down to about here. And you wind up with just an RTS, return from subroutine. So the self-test is very short if you undefine self-test. Now, optimize is my way of saying, should you take out extra code? Or if you disable something, should you just pad it with no ops? Because early in the game, I didn't have this fully relocatable yet, but I still wanted to make some changes. But so I made it so that you could patch in place with some changes and I would just no op the same number of bytes. So nothing moves around. You can't make big or cumbersome or complex changes easily that way, but we'll find out what we used it for. If there's anything still here, I'm not even sure, actually. We'll find out. So this was a table that I found not being used. I'm quite sure it's not used. It's right at the beginning of memory. Now, there's always a chance it's read by the math box or by something else that has access to the address and data pins of the CPU. But even looking at the circuit, and I'm not a hardware guy, I don't see any way for anything else to get at the ROM, so I don't see that anything else could read this table that I don't know about. So this is if you want a tiny patch to Tempest in order to allow you to start on any level. So normally with Tempest, if you just walk up to the game cold, it only lets you start on levels up to level 9. After that, you have to earn your way. And not only do you have to get to a level, you have to finish a level before you can actually start on it. And you can't just start on any level, there are breaks every so often. And by the time you get into the higher levels, like black, they're every 8 levels or so, and then by the time you get to green, there's one at the beginning of green, and that's it. We'll fix that little nicety as well for home use with another modification. But this very simple modification at this point simply changes the branch code to just say never branch to no ops. And so it will let you start on any level. So if I remember correctly, this is a table version of data that is actually calculated by code. So he probably had a table version of it, and then he made it dynamic, but forgot to get rid of the table version. This code is never referenced through this byte, 08, is never referenced directly. But look at all these 08s. So I'm assuming that perhaps it's referenced by this location back one. And so I did not optimize this byte out, even though there's no references to it. Okay, alternate start table. Let's have a look at that. So there was never any plan for me to encourage or allow people to take this modified ROM image and run it in an arcade or in an actual environment. So I only ever do it if you can start on any level. So it's like a championship practice machine setup. The game plays exactly the same, but you're allowed to start anywhere. And with alternate start table defined, you'll be able to start on multiple extra levels that you previously could not. Well, before I go on far too long, I'm gonna hit the whoa button on this one and table the rest of the changes for the next episode. If you want to see purple levels, scores that don't wrap, levels over 100, and so on, make sure you not only subscribe, but that you also ring the bell and turn on personalized recommendations. That way, when I release part four, you'll know about it. For those of you that have been waiting just a little too long for more LED tutorial action, I'm back at it soon with the next episode of the Arduino tutorial series. Yet another reason to subscribe. If you found this video interesting or entertaining, and for some reason your thumbs up icon is still boring old gray, please be sure to join the blue crew by liking the video and turning that thumbs up icon from boring old gray to happy shiny blue. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.